Hello everybody and welcome back to the Peterson Automotive Museum Deep Dive Series. Today we're going to be talking about our 1929 DuPont Model G Speedster. It seems like American cars have always been built to a different formula than those from Europe and England and just about anywhere else in the world. And in the American idiom, this large vehicle was considered a speedster. It was considered a lightweight, maneuverable uh, automobile that one drove around the American landscape, even back in the 1920s. Uh, because even during that period of time, America was dealing with much different circumstances. We used uh, raw materials very freely. There was a lot of gasoline available. And America was a relatively young country, so roads were already becoming wider and wider and distances between towns uh, was, were becoming farther. So really, a car like this made sense for the United States to have. The DuPont had always been a luxury car, even from the very beginning when it was introduced. The earliest ones had six-cylinder engines, but by the time they got to the Model G, they had scaled them up to eight cylinders. Now, the eight-cylinder engine that DuPont was using was bought from a company called Continental which may sound familiar because a number of manufacturers use Continental engines, which incidentally have nothing to do with Lincoln Continental because there was, there was no real connection there. What DuPont did was to, to make their engines look a little bit sexier because they were um, flathead engines, uh, kind of unremarkable looking. They put kind of a faux camshaft cover or a, a faux pushrod cover over the top, and it gave them the appearance of an overhead valve engine, which in 1929 was a much more sophisticated uh, way of designing uh, a, a motor. Um, and of course, since it was eight cylinders, you had to have a very long hood. And it seems like most American cars, indeed most cars from throughout the world during the early 1920s, were judged according to the length of their hood. The longer the hood, the, the, the bigger the frontal aspect, the more luxurious the car was. And the DuPont was a very luxurious car. This vehicle cost over $5,000 brand new, even in its Roadster configuration back in the, in the late 1920s. Now the DuPont Roadster may have cost over $5,000, but for that kind of money, you were getting what only you and six other people could ever have and that was a DuPont Model G Speedster. Now only three of them were configured as at boat tails like our car is. The other th four were configured as uh, taper tails um, speedsters with a spare tire on the back. This car has no spare tire or if it did, the spare tire would have been concealed under the boat tail deck. Another way to specialize your DuPont Model G Speedster was to order a three or four speed transmission. And this transmission is actually the four speed and it was ordered that way brand new from Von Trump Motors right here in Los Angeles because this car was delivered new here in LA. And it was not the first one because Mary Pickford had an identical car. And unfortunately of the seven that were built, hers is the only one known to have been destroyed. So it's, it's kind of a shame, but at least the remainder uh, of the vehicles are here for us to see and appreciate what it must have been like for the world's biggest star to drive around Hollywood uh, during the heyday of the, of the film era. Now the DuPont may not have many exciting features, many um, very um, advanced technical aspects, but what it does have is size and great presence and, and great prestige because you've got this enormous hood and in the day, you could order any number of radiator mascots, and they call them radiator mascots, not hood ornaments, because they were not on the hood, they were actually on the radiator, and they were considered a mascot, not just a mere ornament, because they were kind of an expression of the owner's personality. And in the 1920s, you could get a couple of dozen different kinds of Lalique mascots. Uh, and this one is the eagle's head. Uh, there were also fish, there were frogs you could get, there was a fox that you could get, uh, you could get um, uh, a star, any, any number that you could have placed on a metal plinth and then screwed on to the, to the radiator cap. You could also put a little light 
underneath your glass mascot that when you turn on the headlights, the mascot would light up too. And speaking of headlights, the headlights on this car were wood lights. And the idea uh, behind wood lights was that they had their unusual appearance because they refracted light in a certain way that it actually threw a beam better than it would uh, by any other means. You, you, you have to think that back in the day they had big pie pan headlights that were uh, extremely um, unaerodynamic. So these were a little bit sleeker, but in spite of what the advertising claimed, um, they were very, very bad at lighting the way, but they sure look good. Uh, something else interesting about this car is the fender. It starts at the front. It's one continuous piece of metal that goes directly behind and to the rear. And it even kicks up just a little bit uh, behind the rear tires to give it a that little bit of flare. And you also have a, a wooden platform on which to step to get in the car. Uh, now this was fairly essential because there was no door on the driver's side. Most of the time when you got in the car, uh, it was parked along the side of the road. So you just got in off of the sidewalk. You opened the one door that was on the passenger side and slid across. But if your passenger was already in, maybe you didn't want to step over the passenger. Uh, it was easy enough just to climb up here, step in the car, slide behind the, slide behind the wheel. When you were ready to go, all you did was turn the key and adjust the spark and the throttle and the, uh, the fuel mixture and the, uh, the spark retard and then push a button on the floor and the engine would come to life almost immediately if everything was, was set up right. Um, and the car is so torquey, the engine is so powerful that if you're on the level, you really didn't need first to get off the, to get off the mark. You could start it in second and frankly, you could leave it in second or third all day long because the engine, again, it was so tractable, it was so, it was so torquey, you didn't need to shift it a lot. Uh, but this car would, do an, would hit almost 100 miles an hour. And it was exactly the same kind of car, or virtually, pardon me, and it was virtually the same kind of car that did so well at Le Mans. Uh, a four-seater version raced at Le Mans and acquitted itself very well and, and, and made DuPont um, kind of a household name among racing circles in the day bec because it did so well in that race. Um, the, the vehicle that raced in uh, Le Mans was actually a four place car because they had to be, according to Le Mans rules of the time, family cars or seat four. But this is the, this is the version that sat only two. Uh, and it really is strictly a fair weather car, but now, if it, was, if it was raining or if it was unusually warm that day and you wanted a little bit of shade, you could put up the occasional top by unscrewing the brackets, peeling off the, the uh, leather cover, and raising a framework over which you would put the canvas. And the canvas would snap to the windshield header and in the back it would, it would snap to the uh, rear of the deck. Now, if the time ever came where you needed to transport something, not that a DuPont Model G Speedster was meant for transporting anything, uh, you came to the back, unscrewed two brackets, unlocked the side, and then you could lift up the entire rear end. And this kind of gives the whole thing away. This is why they call it a boat tail, because if you picture this, you could turn it upside down, put a matching one on the other end, and it looks almost like a canoe. It's almost like a, like a boat that you could take down a, a river. Uh, again, a true boat tail configuration. To put it back, you simply dropped it back in place and spun the latches shut and you were good to go again. If you were feeling especially extroverted on your drive out, what you could do was engage the exhaust cutout by actuating a knob that was on the floor of the car. What that did is bypass the muffler and it channeled the exhaust out so that there was much less back pressure, but it also gave it a very aggressive exhaust note. So if you're bearing down on somebody and your Lalique radiator mascot and your gigantic uh, radiator weren't enough to get them to move out of the way, then the exhaust note would certainly capture their attention and, and, have, and have the desired effect. This was a car not for mere transportation. This was a car for sporting purposes when you wanted to make a statement. And in Los Angeles, by the 1920s, you were what you drive and a 
DuPont Model G Speedster would have been the perfect way to say hello to the world. Thank you for joining me on another edition of the Peterson Automotive Museum Deep Dive Series. We'll see you next time.